much for being here today. It is my great honor to present the presenters for today's event. So the six people you will be hearing from are part of the uh, Beyond the Border Policy Research Project, along with some of their classmates who are sitting in the audience. And over the last month, the last eight months, they've partnered with FAMA Quattro, which is a migrant shelter and resource organization based in Guadalajara, Mexico. Now, with FAMA Quattro, FAMA Quattro provided them with various research questions, and they've now, again, spent the fall and spring semesters going in depth into answering these questions. So I'll let them cover what they've found and exactly what they did research on. But I did want to mention a few of the things that went into producing these projects. So number one, these students conducted over 50 interviews with experts, officials in Mexico, and experts on these topics, including the head of Comar, which is Mexico's refugee agency. Number two, they filed countless transparency requests, both at the federal and the state level. And in fact, most of the data that you're going to see today comes from these requests. And some of it will be published uh, when their presentations are published for the very first time ever. Number three, all the students spent a week volunteering in the FAMA Cuatro Migrant Shelter in, Gu in Guadalajara, where they got to meet Central American migrants, get to know them, and also learn more about uh, FAMA Cuatro and the work that they do and what it's like to be a civil society organization working on migration in Mexico. And fourth, the students, or most of the students, also participated in field research in the RGV, the Rio Grande Valley, here in, in South Texas, and also out in Arizona. So, what you all now see today is a combination of all of that, combined with a lot of hard work and research. Um, and also, each group has, they're drawing on uh, 40 to 60 page single spaced research projects that will be published this summer. So this is really just kind of a teaser of all the hard work that, that's behind these presentations. So it's been a lot of work. I'm going to say that one more time because really uh, I've watched them go through it. But I'm really impressed by what they've produced. And I'm really excited that they get to share it with all of you today. So with that, thank you again for being here. And I'll hand it over to Holly. Thank you all for being here today and um, having this space to share our research thus far um, with this semester. Um, we have been focusing on Central American migration to and through Mexico, specifically on four topics. Mexico's Southern Border Program, Mexico's Migratory Detention Centers, Unaccompanied Minors, and Refugee Integration and Resettlement in Mexico. Over the course of this presentation, we hope to first to give you the context and understanding as to why Central American migration. We want to introduce you to three federal agencies in Mexico and how they're important to the work that we've done. We will then, each group, give a presentation regarding our research. And finally, we will have the opportunity for questions and comments at the end of our presentation. So why Central American migration? As you can see, in 2016, there was an important shift in terms of apprehensions at the U.S. southwest border, what we call U.S. southern border. And what happened here in 2016 is that for the first time, there were more Central Americans apprehended than Mexican migrants apprehended at the U.S. southwest border. This is a proxy for the total number of migrants entering into the United States. And this trend has remained. As you can see, for the past three years, there have been more Central American migrants than Mexican migrants apprehended at the U.S. southwest border. As a matter of fact, we have seen more Central Americans than any other uh, regional group entering the United States. Central American migrants almost always transit into or through Mexico in order to reach the United States. So while often immigration is seen as a U.S. issue, our research focuses on Mexico. Therefore, our presentations and recommendations are going to be focused on a Mexican audience. So the relevant Mexican federal agencies um, are here before you. The first, the National Migration Institute, INM, is in charge of supervising and regulating migration in Mexico. INM is similar to the US Immigration and Customs Enforcement. The next is the National System for Integral Family Development, DEEP. And DEEP is in charge of strengthening and developing the welfare of all Mexican families. 
You can think of DEEF as the Division of Administration for Children and Families under the Department of Health and Human Services. And finally, COMAR, the Mexican Commission of Refugee Assistance. Um, COMAR is responsible for integrating refugees into Mexico, and you can think of COMAR like the U.S. Office of Refugee Resettlement. And with these terms under our belt, I would like to ask my colleague to come forward, and we will begin our presentation on Mexico's Southern Border Program. So we're going to begin our discussion on Mexico's Southern Border Program. And in this section of the presentation, we would like to tell you what the Southern Border Program is, how the Southern Border Program was implemented, its effects on migrants, and finally, our recommendations. So securitizing Mexico's southern border is not new. And as a matter of fact, beginning in around 1998, Mexico first started implementing policies to securitize the southern border states. By 2008, irregular or unauthorized migration had been decriminalized in Mexico. And in July 2014, former Mexican President Enrique Peña Nieto implemented Mexico's southern border program. That southern border program had initially two objectives. The first was to protect migrants transiting through Mexico. The second was to securitize the southern border with an emphasis on safety and economic development in those southern border states. Through our research, however, what we noticed is that those two objectives were not successful equally. We saw that by cracking down on securitization in the southern border states, there was adverse effects on the migrant populations moving through those states. Um, essentially, this was a recriminalization of migration in Mexico. And finally, we also noticed that enforcement operations peaked about a year and a half after implementation and began to decline as early as 2016, even though there has been no secondary or additional policy officially implemented in terms of southern border security in Mexico. Thank you. Okay, so this is Mexico's southern border region. To the right, you have Mexico, here's Guatemala, and then there's Belize, and then that dark blue line is Mexico's southern border. Um, the three shades of blue, or it's important to talk about the role that geography plays in Mexico's southern border security and how um, its approach to migration enforcement differs from the U.S. Mexico has a 1,000 uh, kilometer long um, southern border, which is really porous and difficult to enforce. But then it has the Isthmus of Tehuantepec, this narrow area right here, which funnels all northbound traffic to the, to the United States. So instead of focusing on its long border, Mexico focuses on this narrow choke point, um, and this is where INM conducted most of its operations. So you have, under the Southern Border Program, there were three, um, they implemented a three-layer security system. Um, the first layer is the Southern, it's a border control area, which wasn't really too regulated, but along there you have the border, the official border crossings. Um, and then in the middle, you have the internal control area. Um, this is where INM conducted the majority of its operations. Um, and you have in there five mega checkpoints, which operate very similar to U.S. border crossing. They're interagency centers of cooperation, and they are located on um, the main highways in Mexico to funnel all of that northbound traffic and screen um, for migration and contraband and other things like that. Um, and then finally, you have the containment area, and that is in the narrowest part of the isthmus. And that area right there is about 200 kilometers wide of its narrowest point, so that's just about the distance between Austin to Houston. So I'll talk a little bit about enforcement under the Southern Border Program. Um, apprehensions were a really big component of this. Um, in 20, from 2013 to 20, or 2015, uh, apprehensions in Mexico doubled, and then actually by 2017, these had declined uh, by half. And so that was suggesting some sort of return to a pre-southern border status quo. And this is a chart of apprehensions in Mexico as a percentage of U.S. apprehensions at its southern border. So this, before the southern border program was started, Mexican, the number of Mexican apprehensions or apprehensions in Mexico were just below, were about 50, 15%. 
um, of U.S. total apprehensions. And then after the southern border program was implemented, these skyrocketed to over 70% of U.S. apprehensions. So that was showing that there was a really big shift in policy and approach in Mexico. And then they started to decline again, as you see, um, in 2016, 2017. Um, this is important because we, um, as, as Mexico began to crack down and become more aggressive in enforcement and apprehending migrants, fewer migrants were able to reach the United States border. And so there's, we don't know for sure, well, there's, there's no explicit, um, sorry. The, the Southern Border Program didn't explicitly mention um, preventing migrants from getting to the U.S. border as a, as a goal, but, um, but as it, um, I'm sorry, as uh, instead the U.S., um, we think that it was an implicit goal and that um, the U.S. may have had some sort of hand in the program. Um, and so this is, this is important because the Southern Border Program uh, was effective in preventing migrants from arriving at the U.S. border. So INM agents are the ones conducting these operations. And what we saw between 2013 and 2015, so this is before the implementation of the Southern Border Program and the year after it was implemented, was nearly uh, doubled the number of total operations. And these operations are INM agents checking immigration papers, immigration statuses at our at the fixed and mobile checkpoints, as well as on trains, train tracks, public parks, and other areas within Mexico. And so what you see after <coughs> the implementation of the program is essentially a double of total operations in the southern border states. Fairly quickly, however, there is a decline in the total number of operations. By 2017, you see about three quarters the number of those operations, which is actually below the total number of operations that were happening prior to the implementation of the program. This is interesting also because the number of INM agents who were deployed to the southern border states increased under the implementation of the Southern Border Program. In Chiapas specifically, 18% more INM agents are working in that state. What did not decrease is the number of agents. And so that 18% increase of agents in Chiapas remained static after 2014, despite this decrease in total operations. Additionally, we saw INM conducting more joint operations under the Southern Border Program. This graph shows the percent of joint operations conducted between INM and these agencies. Joint operations are INM, an agency that cannot use force, conducting these operations, again, checking for papers, um, rating at trains, checking at parks, etc., cetera, um, with agencies that do have the ability to use force. Under the migratory law, we understand that INM has the right to conduct these joint operations with the federal police and with the Navy only in coastal states in Mexico. And so this brings up two kind of questions for us. Because we were unable to obtain um, the lawful right to conduct these joint operations with some of these uh, agencies, the Army, for example, which conducted about 20% of the joint operations with INM, was never able, or has not to this point, provided us the proof that they have a legal ability to do so. But clearly, these joint operations are still happening. And so we're wondering, A, could these operations be illegal if they're conducted outside of the federal police and the Navy? And B, because there are no stated protocols for use of force between INM and these other agencies, are migrants at greater risk for physical harm during these joint operations? So these enforcement operations impacted how migrants traveled through Mexico. Um, migrants had to rely on different forms of transportation. For instance, they stopped using the train as much. They also began to travel in more isolated routes and they began to use guides or smugglers um, increasingly after the program was implemented. We started seeing them use guides um, more starting in 2013, and with this increased reliance on guides, they began to, um, the guides began to charge more money. So you see 
from 2011 to 2017, the price of a guide had, had more than doubled. And the largest increase in, um, the largest price increase over a single year was between 2013 and 2014, right around when the Southern Border Program was started. And that was a 22% increase. Uh, we, we found that the changes in how migrants traveled and their increased encounters with migration enforcement authorities um, resulted in an increase in crimes against migrants. Uh, between 2014 and 2015, crimes against or reported crimes against migrants had, had more than doubled, um, and then they started to drop off again. And we don't know for sure that this is the direct result of the Southern Border Program because there could be other factors um, influencing this, but the corresponding patterns with increased enforcement and then it dropping, the same with apprehensions, and then with the crime seems to be very um, suspect and telling um, that these two things were in fact related. So on that note, I will discuss the four recommendations our group put together um, to address some of the issues that we identified through our research. Um, one of the major issues, as we've mentioned, has been with the Southern Border Program was that it effectively criminalized migration. Um, so we recommend that Mexico work on regularizing migration by increasing temporary pathways for, um, for Central Americans. Right now, they have worker visas that they can use in the Southern Border states, but we're recommending that this be expanded to all of Mexico um, so that they can work throughout the entire country. And then second, we would like Mexico to grant humanitarian visas to vulnerable groups. Uh, as Holly was mentioning, there was a lot of concern with joint operations and their, they, um, their questionable legality. And this kind of um, gray area creates a lot of room for corruption and abuse of migrants. And so we recommend that Mexico clarify its legal mandates for joint operations. Um, particularly by updating the migratory law um, to define which authorities are able to conduct joint operations with INM. And second, we recommend that they create some sort of accountability mechanism for joint operations. And then third, we had a really hard time finding official government information on the Southern Border Program and we weren't able to find really anything about the Southern Border Program's governing body. Um, this is despite the fact that Mexico has a relatively robust transparency law that requires government agencies to have public websites. So we are recommending, well, and this also creates a lot of issues with accountability and knowing whether the program is working or not. And so we're recommending to resolve this that Mexico create a public website for the governing body of the Southern Border Program, a, a website that is already legally mandated, and that they provide public documentation on the Southern Border Program. And then finally, as um, Mexico tried to securitize its, or to secure its border by cracking down on migration, and as a result, it failed to uphold its goal of protecting migrants. So uh, we're recommending that Mexico focus on providing, um, in, on providing humanitarian assistance in the southern border states to re both residents and the migrants there, and this would be in the form of medical assistance, public work programs, and um, and job creation programs. And that concludes our discussion of the Southern Border Program, and we will pass it on to the detention group. already heard about, which happened in 2008, and then legislation that happened in 2011 called the Migratory Act, which formalized the decriminalization and really set up how migrants are treated in detention centers and generally in Mexico after they're apprehended. Uh, we divided our research into four sections. So first we're going to discuss an overview of the detention system, what it looks like when a migrant is apprehended and where they're held. Next, we'll talk a little bit about how long migrants are held for, generally. Um, third, we'll go into some of the conditions in detention centers today. And last, we'll review some recommendations that we, that we think would help um, the migratory detention system in Mexico. So first, when a migrant is apprehended in Mexico and they don't have paperwork, 
Um, they can be processed in a few, in one of a few places, and that's a place where they're formally booked and their information is taken down. So through transparency requests, we have information on exactly where migrants can be booked in Mexico. All the red dots show places um, that, are, that are official detention facilities, and those are places where migrants might be held either for a few days, a few weeks, or sometimes for several months. Um, so the red dots are really concentrated in central and southern Mexico, with a few that are at the northern, or at the northern border, but most of them are in that southern half of Mexico. Um, something really interesting that we found in our research was these blue dots, which are called other points of processing. Um, so this is something that we had not really read in any of the papers before filing transparency requests, um, but these other points of processing are um, somewhat nebulous places where migrants can be officially booked. In theory, they should only ever be held in formal detention facilities because those are places that have uh, been established to have appropriate conditions for them. But the blue points are these other points where INM, which is the National Institute for Migration, says that they don't hold them for longer than a couple of hours and that they're always transferred on the very same day to an official facility. But if you notice, some of them are pretty far from um, the red dots. And so for some of these that are more remote, uh, we wonder how realistic it is that the migrants are really being transferred the same day to a facility or how long they're actually spending in these other points of processing where there's very little framework to regularize or, or know kind of what's going on. Um, so the next, the next step in the process is detention. Migrants can be detained under the Migratory Act for up to 15 business days, um, and in exceptions, up to 60 business days. And those exceptions might be if they don't have access to paperwork or have difficulty contacting the country of origin to establish um, citizenship, um, if they have a disability, or if they're trying to apply for refugee status in Mexico, then they might be held for longer but in no circumstances should they be held for longer than 60 days. And the Migratory Act establishes very specific conditions under which they should be held so that they are treated in a humane way. And Alexa will discuss a little bit more of those conditions. Um, and the last, the last part of the process is release, which can happen in basically one of three ways. They're either deported back to their country of origin, or they can voluntarily return to their country of origin. Um, and then some of them do stay in Mexico um, and, per and pursue refugee status or apply for another humanitarian visa. But in 2018, over 80% of migrants who were detained in Mexico were ultimately deported. And last, I'm gonna talk a little bit about just how long migrants usually spend in detention. Um, so this was really interesting data that we found. It shows data from 2009 to 2017. As you can see in 2009, the average length of detention was significantly longer than in subsequent years. Um, it's over 15 business days. And between 2010 and 2017, it stays pretty consistent between six and seven, six or seven business days. Um, so we hypothesize that the decrease could be a result of the, of the legislation changes in 2008 and 2011, which were really happening in that time to decriminalize migration and to address um, some of what was going on with migrants in Mexico. We unfortunately can't say that for sure because we only have data going back to 2009, so it could be coincidental. But the timing does make us wonder if that could be the reason for the, um, the decrease in average length of stay. And last, um, so the Migratory Act specifically prohibits uh, holding migrants for longer than 60 business days. And generally speaking, they do a pretty good job of, of, of doing that. Um, but in about 1.5% of cases, migrants are held for longer than 60 business days, and in some cases for extremely long periods of time, over 100 or over, over 150 business days, so they could actually be in detention for years. Um, so that is something that is definitely the exception and not the rule, but does happen occasionally. Pass it on to Alexa for questions. So regarding detention, detention center conditions, um, we examined four themes under this um, <laughs> under the specific item. Um, the first is hygiene, the second is access to legal services, the third is uh, interpreting services, as well as uh, vulnerable groups. And these four things are discussed at length um, under the Migratory Act and were part of the Mexican policymakers and lawmakers trying to create humane conditions and addressing just a, a legacy of the Mexican state um, not protecting these migrants. Moving on. Um, so we'll begin with hygiene. Um, the Migratory Act establishes that adequate items should be available to all migrants while they're in detention. 
However, we found that there is no actual definition of adequate and that it varies drastically by facility. Uh, this actually, uh, the variation by facility is an overarching theme with a lot of these challenges that we found regarding detention center conditions. Uh, moving on to legal services, again, the Migratory Act establishes that written communication as well as any sort of material for uh, migrants who are illiterate should be available to migrants um, while they're in detention and that they can um, be visited by family and civil society um, to gain access to legal care. And this is specifically for migrants who are looking to maybe apply for refugee status, maybe uh, a case of family reunification. Nonetheless, migrants are generally uninformed of their just basic uh, rights in Mexico. The third topic uh, regarding interpreters is that the Migratory Act establishes that interpreting services should be available in the first language of a migrant. This is uh, particularly important for migrants that come from Guatemala or any other indigenous community or literally any other country that does not have Spanish um, as a predominant language. Um, again, that translated informational material should be provided in detention centers. However, we found that interpreting services or material were only available in two to three languages. And the examples that we found were English and in French. Um, and that in many cases, migrants had to interpret for each other. And then the fourth theme is uh, regarding high-risk groups. This includes disabled people, um, pregnant women, LGBTI individuals, and the Migratory Act does a lot to actually identify this, and at the time this is monumental for just the fact that Mexican lawmakers established these high-risk groups um, and recognize them. However, specific needs are not necessarily identified <coughs> with an intake interview, as Lisa mentioned, when a migrant is um, is processed in a detention center, an uh, item official will sit them down and do an intake form or a sort of an initial interview and get down their basic information. Um, and ideally, a vulnerable person or a high-risk person will be identified in this process of the detention system, however they are often not. Which brings us to the recommendations portion of this presentation. Um, and we have at least three recommendations, starting with short-term, moving on to long-term, um, regarding the detention center. The first one is to promote transparency measures. We see this more in the short term, um, and this is just a standardized data reporting across IMM regional offices. IMM is a federal agency in Mexico. However, they do have regional offices that operate um, in regions of Mexico. But we found this particularly frustrating in our research as well as other groups that we would receive different information from, for example, an office in Chiapas or an office in Tamaulipas. Um, and just different languages, the transparency requests were varied. Um, so we see this being implemented uh, to fund and staff items internal monitoring center, which already has a legal precedent. However, we found, again, through a transparency request that it did not have a budget since 2014. And moving on to the second recommendation is uh, a more of a medium term recommendation is to improve conditions of detention as a whole. Again, this is legally mandated under the Migratory Act to, that already establishes this very clear mandates of conditions and humane um, considerations for migrants while they're in detention. Um, however, in practice, that is often not the case. So basically, just to improve conditions to align with the Migratory Act and to continue close, uh, closing offending detention facilities, which since 2017 uh, <coughs> have been uh, closed from the transparency request that we received. And this is a large part to civil society um, organizations and NGOs that are doing a lot of monitoring work um, in Mexico. And our final recommendation is to the redefine the legal framework. This is more of a long-term goal. Um, and this is to remove unclear language from the Migratory Act. Um, our report discusses at length, and there is um, a little table in the handout that discusses the discrepancies between legal language, um, starting from the Migratory Act from the Mexican Constitution to actually how detention works in practice and what those terms mean. Um, so this is just to align consequences for regular migration of those administrative infractions, because again, in 2008, uh, migration was decriminalized in Mexico, but in practice, this is not often the case. Um, and with that being said, uh, this concludes the presentation for detention centers, and I will pass it on to you. I'm going to be discussing um, a specific population of the migrant uh, of migrants called uh, unaccompanied minors. Um, so when I speak talk about unaccompanied minors, I'm specifically referring to anyone migrating under the age of 18 who is traveling without their parents or legal guardians. 
Um, and our research uh, question was really focused specifically on how Central American unaccompanied minors access Mexico's protection system. Um, and I'm going to go into a little bit more detail about four areas of our research. The first is uh, on migration statistics that will kind of show why uh, Central American unaccompanied minors have become a more relevant uh, and population that is in need of protection. Then I'm going to go over the protection system that it, it currently exists in Mexico it, under Mexico's immigration framework. I'm going to address a couple of the challenges that we found in that uh, framework. And finally, I will detail a few recommendations that spring from the challenges we found. So this first graph here shows uh, the number, number of apprehensions for Central American unaccompanied minors in Mexico between 2009 and 2018. Um, as you can obviously see, it's grown incredibly uh, in the past 10 years. A couple of things I want to point out um, is that if you look at uh, 2014, um, the change between 2014 and 2015, that kind of coincides with the um, implementation of the Southern Border Program. And as many of you might remember, um, in 2014, there was a huge increase of Central American unaccompanied minors being apprehended at uh, the U.S. Southern border with Mexico. Um, and we think that the increased number of apprehensions in uh, 2015 might be a result of the U.S. putting more pressure on um, Mexico to increase enforcement, as was discussed in the Southern uh, Border Program. So all told, uh, the population we're talking about here is about 80,000 unaccompanied minors during this time period who were apprehended. Um, and this is likely only a fraction of uh, hundreds of thousands of unaccompanied minors who were traveling through Mexico during the same period. So now I'm going to talk kind of about what happens to these 80,000 unaccompanied minors when they are apprehended um, by immigration officials. Um, and the first step, of course, is apprehension. Um, and when they are apprehended by INM officials, they are taken to a detention facility or another processing point, as the detention center group discussed, uh, for uh, immigration procedure. And what that immigration procedure specifically consists of is uh, a medical checkup, an assignment of a child protection officer, which is also known as an OPI, and then that um, child protection officer completes a best interest assessment. Uh, this, best interest, this best interest assessment really is an interview that the child has with the child protection officer, kind of detailing things about uh, why they're migrating, uh, what has happened during their migration, um, what the conditions are like back in their home country and if they might face any threats of uh, violence. Um, and the best interest assessment is extremely crucial uh, for the protection of these unaccompanied minors because it is what is primarily, primarily used to determine whether unaccompanied <coughs> minors qualify for international protection in Mexico. Um, once, once the immigration procedure has been completed, uh, unaccompanied minors are supposed to be immediately transferred to a state-run shelter. Um, these shelters are run by DEEF, which is uh, the organization responsible for the care of children and families. Um, and the reason they do this is because uh, unaccompanied minors are not supposed to spend uh, any undue amount of time in these detention, detention facilities and rather be sent to a location that has uh, that ideally has the services meant for unaccompanied minors. So these uh, shelters um, provide educational services, medical services, as well as uh, mental health services that are specifically for unaccompanied minors. And it's really important to note that unaccompanied minors, uh, these, these shelters are closed doors, so these unaccompanied minors are required to stay in the shelters <coughs> until their immigration status is resolved. And that leads us directly to this resolution of the unaccompanied minors' uh, immigration status. Uh, which, and this, their status is resolved primarily in one of two ways. The first being that they are deported back to their home country, um, or that they receive international protection in the form of refugee status or humanitarian visa. Um, for, even for unaccompanied minors who are applying for refugee status, uh, they are required to stay in the shelter, both while their application is being processed and once their application is approved. Um, so in some cases, this means that these children uh, and minors are not able to leave the shelter for months. <coughs> um, 
Okay, um, and now I'm going to go into a little bit more detail about some of the challenges we found in the immigration system for unaccompanied minors that I've hinted at uh, before. Um, the first thing I'm going to talk about is the makeup of these state-run shelters. So like I mentioned before, these state-run shelters are designed specifically for unaccompanied minor migrants, but they're not solely for foreign unaccompanied minors. As you can see, in 2010, um, over 85% of of the unaccompanied minors in these state-run shelters were uh, Mexican nationals. So what this means is that they were uh, Mexican unaccompanied minors primarily residing in the United States who were then deported back to Mexico. Um, but you can see as migration from Mexico has uh, declined and migration uh, of Central Americans has increased, the, the population of these shelters has dramatically changed. And this is important to note because uh, these two populations have different needs. So uh, Central Americans uh, need to be screened in Mexico for international pr uh, protection needs to see if they will be uh, safe or not if they were returned to their own countries. And what we found through transparency requests for to each uh, state chief system is that there is a real dearth of state programs that are accessible for Central American unaccompanied minors. This map. Uh, shows the number of uh, programs accessible by state. And as you can see, the large majority of them are, uh, the, all of the ones that are in white have no zero programs accessible for unaccompanied minors. And this co uh, contrasts with um, state programs accessible for Mexican repatriated unaccompanied minors, which almost every state has. Uh, and then the next challenge I'm going to go into really details more into uh, the role of these, the child protection officers I mentioned earlier, also known as OPIs. What this map uh, shows is the, in, in the, the shaded color, is the number of apprehensions uh, per state, and the numbers show the number of child protection officers per state. And there are some areas where you can see that the distribution of child protection officers do a good job, like in the southern state of Chiapas, it has the highest number of applications and 31 child protection officers. But there are other places like Mexico City, um, which has almost it has very few apprehensions, but has 44 uh, child protection officers. And part of the reason for this is because these positions for child protection officers are not full time, and a lot of so they're not always directly working with unaccompanied minors, and rather they're performing other tasks within the uh, within INN. Okay, and so now finally I'm going to detail just a couple of our recommendations that we have that spring from uh, the challenges we face. The first is just really to clarify and enforce the federal and state obligations uh, for, uh, for unaccompanied minors. Um, there, as, as I said before, there, the OPIs are not always uh, adequately distributed, and also it doesn't seem uh, like even when they are, there are, are a sufficient amount of them. Many unaccompanied minors report not receiving best interest assessments or even meeting with an OPI which if this doesn't happen, then they're not able to be adequately screened for protection needs um, and receive refugee status. So our recommendation is that they improve the funding and allocation of these child protection officers. Um, and also going off the map detailing the dearth of state programs, we recommend that the federal DEEF system um, outline um, what the responsibilities of the state <coughs> are for unaccompanied minors and that, and for, each state to have its own program that uh, offers social services to uh, The second recommendation we have is uh, regarding the Attorney General for the Protection of Children and Minors. Uh, this government agency is responsible for ensuring that other agencies uh, enforce the human rights of all unaccompanied minors that are guaranteed under the law. Um, but what we really found is that this does not often happen. Um, for example, uh, uh, unaccompanied minors are, are sometimes kept in detention centers for, for extended periods of time, but there's no real mecha mechanism for um, the Attorney General to, to force INM uh, to transfer them to these state shelters. Um, and so, and we see this as primarily for two reasons, because they don't have uh, sufficient um, money and they don't have sufficient political power. So what, what we recommend is to separate them out from under the deep system um, into as their own agency and to better fund and empower them. And then our final uh, recommendation is really to provide an alternative to detention for these unaccompanied minors. And the real issue here is that uh, 
Unaccompanied minors are being essentially detained in one of two ways, by um, remaining in detention centers for extended amounts of time, or uh, um, being forced to stay in closed door shelters even once they have received refugee status. Um, and so specifically for that population of unaccompanied minors who is pursuing international protection, uh, we believe that there should be, uh, that Mexico should expand its system of open door shelters. Currently there are only two open door shelters for unaccompanied minors in Mexico, in all of Mexico, and we would like to see that expanded to all, um, to all of Mexico. And then our other recommendation uh, is to um, provide alternatives for the unaccompanied, uh, for unaccompanied minors to leave the detention system altogether, whether it is to live with extended uh, relatives uh, in Mexico who are residing in Mexico who might not be their legal guardians, or to establish some type of foster care system that would allow them, um, allow recognized refugees who are unaccompanied minors to not um, spend uh, months or years in the, um, in the closed door shelters. And just the final thing I really want to um, hit home is that it's really important to note that for these unaccompanied minors, having this uh, closed door system is a huge disincentive for them to seek international protection at all. Um, so even if these unaccompanied minors have a genuine fear of, uh, of violence in their home country, they may, many of them will not choose to even uh, try to find protection in another country uh, because they don't want to live out the, um, their life in closed door shelters without being able to go to school and participate in normal activities um, until they turn 18. Um, and this concludes our presentation on non-accompanied minors, and I'll pass it, pass it on to the refugee group. Thank you. All right. So our group was um, tasked with answering two research questions. The first research question was, what obstacles do um, refugee status seekers face when trying to gain status? And then second, once they have obtained status, what obstacles do they face to integrating into Mexico's culture, society, and workforce? And I want to um, just clarify here, when I say refugee status, uh, for any of you that are familiar with the US legal system in immigration, that most um, closely is equated with um, asylum in the U.S., but in, in Mexico it's known as refugee status, so just to be clear. And then finally, I'll go over our recommendations. All right, so one of the keys to understanding um, the whole situation with refugees in Mexico is being able to understand how many applications that Comar, Comar is the refugee agency, um, is receiving over the last few years. Uh, 2019 here is a um, projection based off the first three months, but you can see in that first three months alone, they have already received more applications than they did in all of uh, 2016 combined. Um, and this is showing no signs of slowing down. So this increase in applications is putting tremendous stress on the agency and on the system as a whole. And when you consider that the agency's uh, access to resources has not increased uh, accordingly, uh, you can imagine that the problems that the agency is having. From 2013 to 2019, the agency's budget, or I'm sorry, the amount of applications increased over 3,500%. But yet the increase in the budget was negligible. And so this really doesn't equate or match up and um, has really uh, kind of bogged the agency down. And we have an update. So um, one of the big problems or one of the results of this lack of resources and the increase in applications has uh, become the processing times for these applications. And right now this is probably the biggest obstacle to obtaining refugee status in Mexico. And it's definitely a deterrent. 
So from the time people submit an application, uh, they're legally supposed to receive a response on that application within 45 business days. Comar can apply for a 45-day extension if they need to, um, and then people are supposed to receive either denied, approved, complimentary protection, a response. And nowadays, um, immigration lawyers in Mexico are saying that these response times are closer to a year. And so what that has done has created this huge backlog in applications. You can see in 2016, the agency finished the year having adjudicated almost every single application. In 2017, they finished the year with over 50% of applications pending. And then through the first nine months of 2018, um, it's just increased and increased until you have this massive backlog of applications. And knowing this through anecdotal evidence, a lot of migrants just simply choose not to apply for refugee status. And there are other factors, there are restrictions on their movement and um, reporting requirements, but this is the most pronounced. So for those that do go through the whole process and do get a positive um, decision on their application, uh, you can see right here, there, since 2013, there are about 13,000 uh, people that have received uh, refugee status in Mexico. The majority of them are from El Salvador, Honduras, and Venezuela. And it's not until the, recently that Venezuela has really seen a big uptick in applications and approvals. Now, one of the reasons for Venezuela's large approvals here is um, the percentage in which they see positive uh, outcomes. So their approval rates compared to other countries is about 50%. You can see of all applications, about 50% approved. Whereas you look at Honduras over here, Honduras is less than 25% of people that apply are receiving positive outcomes on their applications. Now there are bigger geopolitical reasons um, for some of this, but at the core of it, adjudicating the Central American applications, when I say Central American, I'm referring to El Salvador, Honduras, and Guatemala, and these applications and cases are quite um, complex. So people don't just apply for refugee status for one problem, whether it's uh, fleeing gang violence. Usually it's um, a myriad of problems and a mixture. They flee for um, economic reasons, for a lack of institutional support, no protection from um, the police state, and also gang violence and um, other um, factors. So it's really quite complex to try and adjudicate these Central American um, applications. All right, so once somebody gains refugee status, um, the second half of our research really focused on integration challenges. Uh, what people need to do to become um, an integral part of Mexico's society, culture, and workforce. So there were five areas that we really took a look at, and those were education, employment, healthcare, high-risk groups, and discrimination. And so both international law that Mexico has subscribed to and domestic laws uh, provide a lot of protections and legal rights for refugees in Mexico. However, there are a lot of challenges for refugees in trying to exercise these rights. So in education, uh, refugees have the right to access public and private education and some of the challenges they face in trying to exercise these rights include cultural and language um, integration issues in the classroom. A lot, um, as mentioned before, a lot of these migrants don't speak Spanish, and for those that speak, for example, indigenous languages, there are very few um, interpretation services offered in the classrooms. Um, as far as administrative burdens go, uh, you can look at the fact that people try to um, try to recertify their education um, from different countries. So if you've completed up to the third grade in Guatemala, trying to get Mexico to recognize that, and then starting in the fourth grade in Mexico, and going through the bureaucracy to try and do that is an example of an administrative challenge. Um, in terms of employment, uh, refugees in Mexico have the right to obtain document, uh, documentation and legal right to work 
and to work for fair wages. Some of the challenges they face in trying to exercise these rights include a lack of a network in the country and um, really help trying to find work. And they also are often forced to work informally or under the table. And then when they find themselves in these situations, they lack the leverage to really um, report these bad conditions and these mistreatments. In terms of healthcare, refugees in Mexico have the right to access um, the country's uh, healthcare system and to gain insurance in order to do so. Some of the challenges they face in trying to exercise these rights include uh, lack of access to mental health services, um, no access to sexual health services, a lot of uh, migrants in their home country and then also on the migrant trails in Mexico uh, go through a lot of trauma and access to these services is really important, especially for women. Um, and then also any deficiencies in accessing healthcare can have a ripple effect across a lot of, er a lot of other areas. And then high-risk groups, which earlier were described as um, LGBT groups, uh, pregnant women, elderly, disabled, uh, they are supposed to be guaranteed the right to institutional assistance and special protections from the state. However, they often face a lot of challenges in trying to exercise these rights. A lot of the public and people that work in institutions are unaware of these rights and lack the knowledge to try and help them uh, give special assistance. Um, and then finally, oh, I'm sorry, for uh, impunity for abuses, whenever somebody tries to report some of these abuses, um, there's very uh, little recourse for that. And then finally, discrimination, and discrimination is really pervasive across all the other areas of integration efforts, and it really just affects each and every one in other areas of their lives. Um, discrimination can happen just for, just for being a refugee, and it can range from denying services to being the victim of uh, hate crimes. It's really a vast uh, spectrum here. And so, some, uh, we have three recommendations on ways that we think that we can increase access to uh, refugee status and then also improve integration efforts. And so the first recommendation is going to be to overhaul Comar. Um, Comar plays a central role in, in the whole system. They are the key, key player in adjudicating applications, and they are supposed to be helping with integration efforts also. And so we recommend providing the agency a budget that's commensurate with its workload. And in the report, we provided a detailed breakdown and calculation on how much they should be appropriated. And then with that also, we've, um, we've recommended improving fiscal transparency and the way they, um, way they budget. Uh, we recommended reducing the administrative burdens placed on refugees. Um, so in addition to these long processing times, refugees are also <coughs> forced to stay in the same state that they submitted the application, and then they're forced to come and physically check in once a week. We've recommended uh, reducing these requirements to allow more flexibility with refugees that are working and um, to also keep the rigor in Comar's um, reporting. And then another big one that we talked about is expanding Comar's geographic scope. So currently, the agency only has offices from Mexico City and South. Now this is where the majority of people are crossing into the country, but a lot of people extend past that, that reach. And so we've recommended opening a representation in Monterrey, which is the northernmost city that has received the most refugee applications um, in the northernmost states. And then for improving, excuse me, improving integration, we recommended developing um, a tool, uh, to integration tool to kind of develop a metric to really start measuring integration and what that means to be able to say you're doing a good job or you're, you're deficient in that area. Other parts of uh, the US, um, big cities in the US, have developed similar tools and also other places in Europe. And so we think this would be a good tool for Mexico to have. And then across education, employment, and health, 
there's a lot of similarities in the integration efforts that need to be made across these areas, including um, better awareness, um, increasing uh, training for employees. Uh, one recommendation that we had for employment specifically was to develop sort of a market snapshots <laughs> to show job saturation, available jobs in each of the areas and cities that could be provided to refugees as they get their employment authorization documents. And then our final recommendation is going to be combat discrimination. Uh, there is uh, a dearth of information on this, and so we've recommend conducting a public opinion survey to really try to get at the heart of the problem and the reasons um, people uh, discriminate against refugees and to better understand the root causes of things. And then we've also recommended a number of cultural and um, kind of service learning activities such as public art exhibition or public art and museum exhibitions and then some school um, school field trips and museum things and like that. Thank you for your time. And now um, I'd like to invite the groups back up here and we're gonna take questions. Geographic spread and kind of getting at a presentation whether um, people have to physically be in those places when they're being processed. Yeah, so um, no, it's not done in the court and it's done in where there's an application and then there's an in person interview with a Komar protection officer and that person almost single handedly makes the decision on whether or not that person is granted uh, refugee status. And from, we did a number of interviews with former Komar officers that, that did these, and they even themselves complained that it's just completely up to that person's discretion. Obviously, there's a system they go through to check uh, the veracity of the story, conditions in their country, and things like that. But ultimately, that one person makes a decision on the case, sends it to a supervisor for final approval, and that determines whether or not they get refugee status. And then to your second question about geographic uh, scope. So if somebody is in a state that doesn't have a Comar office, they can turn their application into um, an INM office, which is like uh, immigration enforcement, which one is intimidating, right? If you're there without status and you go to apply for status with somebody that could detain you and deport you, um, it's already another barrier to obtaining refugee status. But once you've submitted that application to that state and to the INM office, you have to stay in that state during the adjudication process. And most likely, Komar officers will do a phone interview with you. And so your fate is decided over the phone. Um, they do do some in-person traveling, but you see like the lack of resources that they have is really kind of hindering that process. And a quick follow-up, is that the same process for minors that they... Uh, yes. So minors can't actually apply um, in person to the Comar offices. Um, they can only apply through um, INM officers. So um, I have a, a, a clarification question, then a, then a bigger question. Um, so the clarification question was, obviously Comar was like the organization you were studying, but was that your customer, your sponsor? Or? No, so our client for this project is um, a migration shelter in Guadalajara, civil society, a nonprofit that okay. is a shelter, but then also has a branch that does a lot of research and things like that, so okay. completely separate. So the, 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 the question I have is that you had, there were a number of sort of bold recommendations, okay, like quadruple their budget and rewrite the legislation so it's not unclear, and um, there was one other one, um, let's see if I can remember what it was, overhaul Kumar. So if they couldn't, they didn't have the resources to do that, they couldn't rewrite the legislation, what would be the biggest return on investment things that Kumar could do? What would be the things, out of all those recommendations, how would you prioritize thinking about attacking the problems you discussed? 
So one recommendation is um, to fill this hole in the budget right now. They're receiving money from United Nations, UNHCR. But the way they use that money, they can use that money, is limited until they sign what's called um, a convenio, like an agreement, a uh, cooperation agreement between Comar and UNHCR. And so by not having this agreement signed and pending, the money that they use cannot be, I'm sorry, the money that they provide cannot be used to help adjudicate applications. So if they just signed this agreement with, and figured out all the details with UNHCR, they could use this money to hire um, protection officers to help adjudicate all these applications. Um, so there are bureaucratic and logistical things that they can do to kind of improve their, their use of resources. Yeah. The, the thing, that's a good, that's a really good response. But the thing I was trying to get at is that, like in one of the presentations you were talking about uneven uh, centers, like some well run, some not well run. That's an internal management problem that an organization can you know, has some effect on without, you know, a group in their budget. So, you know, simple things like regulations, creation of inspector generals, you know, things like that. You know, it, I guess my bigger point is that most public policy problems can be solved by like 500% budget increase, you know, yeah. but you usually don't get that. <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. And then, so another example is that the new head of Comar is um, worked for UNHCR for 28 years. And so previously, the, the director of Komar was like a graphic designer and was like a political <laughs> appointment, literally. Um, and so by making smart hires, putting somebody in there that has uh, experience in refugee resettlement, and then that person, the new director, has also invited uh, UNHCR into the agency to basically house somebody to give suggestions on improving efficiency and uh, kind of reorganizing and things like that. So yep. they are making use of the resources that they have, uh, but more money is always better. Good, thanks. Uh, what is the process for communicating the recommendations for, to your client, and does your client have any influence on responsible parties to actually uh, proceed to implementation? So we'll be giving a presentation to our clients next week. Um, and so we will be speaking directly with them regarding the questions that they asked us. Um, and then in terms of their ability to move forward, uh, as we've discussed, it kind of depends on the scope of the recommendations that we're bringing forward, right? Um, it also depends on if they agree with the recommendations that we're presenting. Do you have a written report in addition to the yes. presentations? Yes, so we have these two pagers, which I would recommend all of you snag on your way out. Um, and then all four groups also have like a 40 to 60 plus appendix paged uh, report that will also be submitted in addition to our presentations to the client. If I could actually just jump in on that as well. Um, the uh, communication will take place uh, between FMA Cuatro, the University of Texas at Austin, and also COLAF, which is the Colegio de la Fuente del Norte, which is a big university. And the person we were working with in the beginning who switched to COLAF um, is the president of INM Citizen Council. So that's one way that we're hoping to distribute it is because the person directly who we're working for is in charge of making recommendations to INM. First, congratulations on that. Thank Pretty you. remarkable. Uh, yeah set of data that you've kind of collected here. Um, to go completely the opposite direction and bring some politics into it, um, it seems like the major political tightrope that Mexico is trying to walk is an impulse under the AMLO administration to be more generous in terms of humanitarian terms to migrants coming through Mexico, but also having to respond to the United States, to the Trump administration, right? And so, you know, in particular with the idea of providing humanitarian assistance and humanitarian visas to everyone who comes through the southern border, how does that affect that dynamic? I mean, how are they supposed to think about that? If you start giving everyone a humanitarian visa, doesn't that encourage more people to come? Or some, you know, even if many of those people are okay with staying in Mexico, won't that potentially increase the number of people who come to the border, leading to maybe a cycle of then having to shut down the visas like they've already done? Like, how do you avoid this sort of politics just blowing it all up. So the humanitarian visas, that would just be for vulnerable <coughs> groups. So okay. it would be, Victoria probably could speak more on this because it's been her 
or pride and joy this semester. <laughs> no, but um, but the humanitarian <coughs> visa would just be for vulnerable groups, and it would be kind of similar to like a credible, like them passing a credible fear interview, mm -hmm. so that they would have kind of a, a visa to pass through the country and not have to evade. Um, detection or um, migration enforcement, because that was a big problem that we were seeing, is that because they weren't able to get appropriate visas and because it was essentially criminalized, even though the law made it, the 2008 law said it was not a crime, they were still having to like go on these um, remote routes and they were getting, they were becoming victims to crimes or you know, susceptible to the elements and things like that. So this would kind of put them on that more regular pathway and give them that pass if they seem eligible to in the country and not just trying to exploit any sort of system. Yeah, that could be a lot of people, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, added to the recommendation, you know, with the humanitarian visa aspect, you know, we also tried to put into place, and we didn't address this in the presentation, but put in place, you know, things that we could do to, like, increase job programs, to encourage migrants receiving humanitarian visas to stay in Mexico. And then also, you know, adding those worker visas, expanding the scope of those worker visas, we hope would also be another form of encouragement, you know, to, to get folks to stay in Mexico. And so. with that, there is a coordinating body for the Southern Border Program. And that body was in charge of those two objectives, which include not only the securitization, but also creating uh, environment, excuse me, economic development within the Southern Border States. And so that was a priority for this uh, organization, this like body, kind of, if you will, um, and they were sporadically involved in doing these kinds of economic development projects. Um, and so part of that recommendation is also looking back to this already established body, this body that has had a budget since fiscal year 2015, but that has been decreasing every year, um, and looking at how this coordinating body could be more effective in approaching that objective of the Southern Border Program, which is economic development within the border states. I think there's one other, just sort of more generally to your question though, that's a, that's a huge question that Mexico is constantly facing, and we've discussed that a lot in our class, is the interesting role that Mexico plays as sort of an arbitrator in what's going on between Central America and the U.S. in a lot of respects, and that um, the journey of Central Americans going through Mexico, uh, in a lot of ways, it, it's just Mexico is, is trying to appease a lot of different people, um, and there's been, as far as what Mexico's new president is going to do, um, which you know we're still seeing because that's only a few months old, I don't think that we have great answers as far as how some of these policies will or won't be implemented and how the administration views that, but that's just something that's going to develop over the course of the next few years and it's really, really complicated. Um, I had a question, well, clarif clarifying question and then a question. And so, you, the first group talked about uh, the number of smugglers and the price of smuggling, how that increased um, around 2016, uh, 2015, 2016. And I was wondering if you attributed that to just increased border security along the Mexican southern border. Did that count? So the number of smugglers, we cannot say that that has increased based on our data. What we can say is that there has been about a 45% increase in use of guides to get through Mexico. That's from Mexico's southern border to the U.S. southern border. And that the price has consistently increased since 2013, with a 22% increase in price just between 2013 and 2014. Okay. Does that clarify? Okay. So you're not you can't say for sure like what I, I can't mean. say that there are more smugglers, okay. um, but we can guess that migrants are not being better protected under the Southern Border Program because they continue to use smugglers to get around um, INM checkpoints to avoid using trains to. Um, have this kind of route rather than feeling confident that they could transit the country without this additional assistance. I'm wondering, that was also like the surge of unaccompanied minors um, coming to New Mexico to the U.S. and I'm wondering how much of an impact that could have in this increase or potential increase of uh, smuggling and even the, the amount that it's charged, right? Because children are, to smuggle children, um, the price is going to be a lot higher than to smuggle adults. So I'm wondering if, that, if there was any data that may have led any, to any of those inferences. Did the data connect 
that at all? I think that's a great question. Um, the data that was used in those charts comes from COLEF, um, so the College of the Northern Border, and they are interviewing deported Central American citizens from the United States. So the people being interviewed for that data are not going to be children. They are predominantly going to be like single males, um, just statistically, because that's who is more likely to have been deported. Um, and so within that data, it wouldn't be a lot of children. It wouldn't be, pe it potentially could be people who were minors when they were crossing, but are no longer minors when they've been deported. Um, but I would not guess that minors or women or family units are well represented in the data that was put forth. I think we have time for one more question. Did you happen to notice any changes in any relation between the changes in the apprehensions and the arrivals at the U.S.-Mexico border? Um, and then that would also correlate back perhaps to these less formal detention centers, the rising cost and yeah. potential for yeah, so we definitely saw that there is a big shift in um, apprehensions in the, at the U.S. southern border and the Mexican southern border region. So as, like right when the program was implemented, Mexican apprehensions in Mexico skyrocketed and then the U.S. apprehensions started to go down and so they almost like switched roles for a little bit. Like US, Mexico's southern border was essentially the U.S.'s second southern border in that during that program um, at least during the height of that program and then once they started kind of letting go once they started easing on the apprehensions you see it switch back again so the data was really interesting because it was just like crisscrossing and you could just see when the policy was at its peak and then when it kind of dropped down but it also correlated then with the quick rise in the cost of transport possibly right? suggest with the involvement of these multi-institutional right, forces right. out there. Yeah, it, it became and, so and much more difficult to cross, to get across Mexico during that time, and so people were just deterred from doing it. But the increase in cost continued even after the apprehension numbers decreased. All right, well, thank you all so much. Please join me. In